I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. A federal judge in Florida has ordered the suspect in Wednesday's deadly shooting rampage at a Florida high school to be held without bond on 17 counts of murder. Authorities say 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz opened fire on the same school from which he'd been dismissed. They added that the AR-15 rifle used in the assault was purchased legally by Cruz. Nicholas Cruz also reportedly had ties to a white nationalist group. A member of a militia group called the Republic of Florida told the Associated Press that the 19-year-old previously took part in paramilitary drills with the organization. The Senate has rejected a bipartisan proposal to provide 1.8 million undocumented immigrants brought into the U.S. as minors a path to citizenship. The measure was six votes shy of the 60 needed to advance. The bill was crafted by moderate Republicans and Democrats billing themselves as the Common Sense Coalition. Health officials say the flu vaccine isn't effectively protecting older Americans and others against the bug that is causing most illnesses. The CDC said today the vaccine is only 36% effective overall in preventing flu illness severe enough to send a patient to the doctor's office. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Peter Thiel's Silicon Valley retreat. Why the tech world's most conservative billionaire and Trump supporter is pulling the plug on the bay and setting up shop in LA. Plus, Google's new plan to limit pop-ups. We will weigh in on the new default defense mechanism against unwanted ads launching today in Chrome and the punishment for repeat offenders. And the CEO of the biggest supplier of semiconductor hardware expects the industry to keep booming. We will get perspective from Applied Materials' Gary Dickerson later this hour. But first to our lead. Billionaire Peter Thiel is calling it quits in San Francisco. According to people familiar with the situation, Thiel is relocating his personal funds, Thiel Capital and Thiel Foundation, and their 50-member staff to Los Angeles. According to the Wall Street Journal, the tech world's best-known conservative and Trump supporter has also discussed resigning from the Facebook board. Joining us now with more, Bloomberg Tech's Ellen Hewitt and Mark Millian. So, of course, Peter Thiel set off a firestorm when he supported President Trump in the first place. There was a big question of whether he even should remain on, on the Facebook board, and, and Zuckerberg defended him. Um, we'll talk about that, but first, what do we know about his move? Well, it sounds like he's moving his staff to L.A. and keeping some of his other investment vehicles, so Mithril Capital and Founders Fund are staying in San Francisco. They're already kind of set up here. But it seems like he's going to move. He already owned a house that he bought a few years ago, and he seems to be calling it quits. So, look, a lot of people in Silicon Valley, in fact, almost all of Silicon Valley, was not happy about his support of President Trump. But, I mean, not is he, is he leaving here. just because he's not well-liked? I mean, why is he doing this? Uh, not uh, according to what he's told uh, some of the people that we've talked to. I mean, he's he's been saying that Silicon Valley is toxic, that uh, he also says, like, you know, there are economic conditions here that make it uh, very expensive and just not a good place to start a business anymore. Um, another incentive is that we've heard he's, and many other people have reported that he's starting a conservative news network. And, uh, you know, L.A. is a pretty good place to start a media company. Uh, there are actually a lot of conservative news organizations based out of there, like Breitbart has a big presence there, Drudge, Do we know Daily anything Wire. more about his media plans? Uh, it still seems pretty early, but it's, uh, he's also looking to buy Gawker, which is not necessarily related, but he's definitely uh, looking to get into the media game. So, Ellen, the Wall Street Journal also reported that he considered resigning from the Facebook board, and at the very least that there was a big tiff between Netflix CEO Reed Hastings, who's also on the Facebook board, and Thiel himself about right. his support for Trump. Yeah, Reed Hastings had written a letter that had been leaked last year, I believe, that basically said that he thought that because Thiel supported Trump that he was unfit to serve on the Facebook board. And, and there were probably other tensions, too. It seems like other people have reported that Mark Zuckerberg also asked Hastings and Teal if they had leaked this information. It just seems like there was a lot of friction in the board. We don't really know why Teal might have wanted to 
leave, but it does seem, you know, it might be related to one of his other complaints about Silicon Valley, which is that it's overrun by groupthink, that everyone thinks the same, and there isn't really, um, you know, an acceptance of other kinds of thinking, and, and maybe he might have felt that same way about the Facebook board. You know, Facebook is also right now in an incredibly difficult position. They are under a lot of pressure uh, to make some dramatic changes, and obviously the accusations that, you know, meddling on Facebook could have swayed the election. Mark Zuckerberg, of course, came out when Thiel supported Donald Trump and said, you know, if you believe in diversity, you know, why would we kick off someone who, who believes in... Uh, Ideological or, or, diversity or, right, was maybe the phrase he supports, used. Supports Donald Trump. Um, you know, but do you think any of this has to do with some of the struggles that Facebook is facing right now? The thing about Teal is he seems to feed off of friction. Mm -hmm. So, and and our our reporting, Lizette Chapman has been talking to a lot of people today. It doesn't seem to reflect any plans for him to actually leave that board. Mm -hmm. um, it's just part of his personality is to disagree with people. I think maybe he feels like, especially a pariah now after the election, and is relocating to LA to have some distance, but. I don't think he's going to remove himself entirely from the Valley scene. He's still going to be a partner at, at Founders Fund, which is his big, big investment vehicle. And he'll be back here constantly talking to entrepreneurs and making investments. What does this mean for Founders Fund? You know, Teal is, to be honest, he's the big name there. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like Founders Fund had said that he's still going to be involved in the same way. He still has to approve the same large investment decisions that Founders Fund makes. And, and Mark is right, Founders Fund is kind of his marquee investment firm. He has other investment vehicles, but this is the one that people in the Valley are most familiar with and, and think most frequently of and when thinking of the name Peter Thiel. How soon is this happening, his move to LA? He's already got a house there, as Ellen mentioned, so he, he's essentially like moving now. Uh, the, the, move, uh, the relocation of the uh, investment, the two investment firms is happening in like the next few months, I think. Um, so it's all pretty imminent, and then that uh, news network, it remains to be seen when that actually happens, but it's definitely something he's thinking about. All right, Mark Milley and Ellen Hewitt of Bloomberg Tech, thank you both. Okay, well, according to the EU, Facebook and Twitter haven't done enough to change restrictive user agreements. That's what the European Union's consumer chief said as she called for stronger rules to punish companies that flout the law. The European Commission statement said Twitter needs to remove terms that curb its liability, acknowledge that it should tell users before it removes content, and create a way for a user to challenge the removal of content. And Facebook needs to clarify its limits to liability and explain how and why it will remove such content. Both should allow users to appeal when their accounts are removed. Coming up, Google is launching a built-in ad blocker for its Chrome web browser. Will it impact the company's domination in the online ad market? We will discuss. That is next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. continues its comeback. The cryptocurrency hit $10,000 again. It's been steadily climbing the last week after a sell-off in January sent Bitcoin plunging from its record highs of almost $20,000. Optimism for cryptocurrencies is increasing this week as a flood of news on regulatory crackdowns earlier this year has been replaced with more positive headlines. Pop-ups, autoplay videos with the sound on or ads that follow you as you scroll on a site. Nearly everyone has been annoyed by an ad on a web browser, and now Google is making some changes to fix this on its own web browser. The vice president of Google Chrome had this to say in a blog post, it is clear that annoying ads degrade what we all love about the web, and that is why starting on February 15th, Chrome will stop showing all ads on sites that repeatedly display these most disruptive ads after they have been flagged. For more, I want to bring in Ben Barocca, CEO of SourcePoint and the former head of Google Marketplace. So, you know, what's your reaction to these changes? You know what, I, I think they're coming from a good place and people are, are really looking at uh, Google to clean up the web. That being said, it is relatively heavy handed mm. and it's just making it so much more difficult for publishers to drive revenues in order to keep their business sustainable. Many publishers are in a bad state and um, it's just getting harder. 
From a user perspective, though, I mean, these pop-up ads are a pain, and it, sometimes it's so it's hard to get rid of them. It certainly is, and, and advertising has gotten very, very aggressive. I think the real future of online publishing is asking for user choice, and at the end of the day... Who would say, yes, I want a pop-up? No, people would say, I'm happily going to consume a pop-up in return for being able to consume some Bloomberg news, mm. right? So there's only very few people that can drive subscription revenues, and so there needs to be that idea of free in terms of what is that value exchange. What about other ad formats instead, though? I mean, there's plenty of other options, aren't there? There certainly are other options, and that being said, kind of beauty is in the you know, eye of the beholder, mm -hmm. and Google is sort of almost single-handedly uh, painting a brush of where you know these particular ad formats are bad, but there may be plenty of instances where they're not bad. How does this compare to policies on other web browsers? So it actually is um, Mozilla in private mode takes out all of the advertising. Brave comes standard takes out all of the advertising. The largest browser in Asia, UC browser, also takes all of the advertising out. So what it's about not Safari? as. Safari has things like ITP, Intelligent Tracking mm -hmm. Prevention, um, and again in private mode they take out all of the advertising. Everyone is trying to find the balance between being harsh and, and keeping users safe. So talk to me about this from the publisher's perspective. You know, you have something you want to advertise. What are publishers deciding between behind the scenes and what are the sort of costs and, and benefits that they're weighing? Sure, so benef uh, the benefits uh, from a publisher perspective is revenue, right? So mm -hmm. they have to choose the user experience that will monetize that particular user while at the same time keep them coming back. So that's the balance that publishers have to weigh every day, every article, every page view. What do you make of Unilever threatening to pull ads from Facebook and Google simply because of the content on their sites? Sure, I, you know, Unilever wants to make sure that they're in well-lit environments that lend credibility to their products. And they want to have those clear programs and clear um, forms of, of uh, articles that just make sense for them. Is it realistic, though? I mean, or is this just a threat? I mean, of, of course, this is where billions and billions of people are. Well, you see CEO Susan Wojcicki talk yesterday at the Code Conference about um, setting those policies and procedures and getting people uh, into reviewing as much content as possible. And you know what? They're trying to do a good job. It's not realistic to have every piece of content reviewed by a human. So we have to do some combination of machines as well as um, humans in order to review that content. Do you think these kind of, well right now it's just a threat, but this kind of concern about the content that's on Facebook or, or YouTube will actually hit the bottom line of the, of, of the, the Facebooks and, and alphabets? Sure. I, I think until they get uh, systems and processes and procedures very clearly in place, there may be some small hit, but I think that they're going to work very hard in making these good environments for advertisers. Where do you see online advertising going? You know, what are the trends in the future that you think might surprise us? I think you're going to see a real resurgence in subscription services. I think you're also going to see choice and transparency in the transaction that happens between content creators and content consumers. And we'll see a wide variety of um, unique pieces of technology that will offer users to be in control of their data, be in control of their attention, and actually um, compensate publishers for that content uh, in a much more innovative way. So, you know, what's coming in terms of, you know, the hierarchy of these platforms? You know, some have suggested that Amazon could actually surpass Facebook as, you know, Google is, is, is clearly in the lead right now, but that Amazon could someday surpass Facebook as the biggest sort of um, attraction for online advertising. So Amazon is an incredible juggernaut as it relates to online advertising, but you also have to think they are also super strong in subscription services. You yourself probably subscribe to Prime, and Prime is not only that you know next day shipping service, but you can watch tons of content and you can read tons of content included in that subscription. So they're really out ahead a bit. Um, and, and I think you'll see more subscription services both with micro payments as well as macro payments into the future. And we'll balance advertising and subscription as a form of uh, making publishing sustainable long term.
All right, Ben Baroka, CEO of SourcePoint. Thank Thanks, you so Em. much for stopping by and sharing your side. All right, Cisco shares jumping out to a 17-year high on Thursday after a bullish forecast from the machinery maker responsible for carrying most of the world's internet data. Cisco is promising increases in revenue after sales rose for the first time in eight quarters to almost $12 billion. The company is reducing its reliance on the shrinking market for high-priced hardware and pivoting to software and services. Coming up, we speak to the CEO of Hotel Tonight, what they are doing to stay ahead of the competition in the battle for your bookings, next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. FCC Chair Ajit Pai is said to be the subject of an internal probe investigating whether or not he acted improperly to help Sinclair Broadcasting purchase Tribune Media's television stations. The FCC Inspector General confirmed the probe to discover if Pai pushed for policy changes specifically to benefit the Maryland-based broadcaster. Sinclair is trying to buy 42 Tribune stations in 33 markets. The merger is being reviewed by the FCC and DOJ. An FCC spokesman called the accusation absurd. In the increasingly crowded marketplace for online hotel bookings, one company was an early entrant in the mobile-only space, Hotel Tonight, a last-minute hotel booking app. Our Bloomberg Deals reporter Alex Barinka caught up with Hotel Tonight CEO Sam Shank at the Goldman Sachs Tech Conference to get the latest on how they are continuing to rise above the competition. Take a listen. We're different because we're mobile only, and we initially focused on the mobile only use case of really last minute rooms. That's how we got in the market and got a foothold and really got a lot of customers using us. And then we've expanded since then to take on more and more use cases. And our customers are now using us for all of their hotel booking. They can book way far in advance. We make it so easy to book at the last minute and give you the very best deals uh, because we use mobile to target the deals at the right customers. So I remember uh, a few months back, I was interviewing the CEO of Travelocity at their IPO date, and it struck me how similar a lot of these companies are. And I hear you on the mobile differentiation, and I hear you on the last minute booking, but it seems like a very uh, crowded space. As you continue to mature, how do you take market share from the bookings.coms, from the Travelocity, from the hotels.coms as you go forward? Yeah, our strategy is to focus on product execution and product innovation mm -hmm. and bringing something really new to customers every time they open the app so it's better and better every day. A lot of small improvements, a lot of big improvements too, like our loyalty and perks program uh, that we revamped at the end of last year. And that's how we're going to win. When you look at the incumbents and the desktop players, most of their R&D efforts have gone into improving the conversion rate of their marketing mm -hmm. and their marketing efficiency, but it doesn't flow down to delighting and uh, providing a great experience for the customer, and that's where we're gonna win. So when you talk about uh, expanding across all of customers, booking needs, business comes to mind. Uh, the likes of Airbnb, uh, some of the larger business uh, booking sites have really been targeting those business customers as well. They spend more, they're sticky. What are you doing to grab that business share? Is it just because co consumers love your site? How is that kind of changing in customer appetite going. When we launched, we didn't really know what type of use case we were gonna get, but we found out of the gate, really solid product market fit with business travelers. They travel at the last minute, they like to save money, they like to save time. On Hotel Tonight, you can book in 10 seconds and just get it done very, very quickly and know you're gonna have a great place to stay. And we're gonna continue to invest in that, in tools to make it easier for business travelers to book, uh, to share their itineraries with uh, coworkers. And you'll see a lot of that, of new things coming from us very soon. Does Airbnb keep you up at night? No, I, I love Airbnb and it's a very complimentary product and uh, compliment 
complementary business to us. So uh, when you look at them, it's going to be a longer length of stay, further in advance. For us, it's a lot of business travel and a lot of weekend getaways at the last minute. It's a big market. There's going to be many winners in this market. We're going to be one of the winners. So you're pushing into this big market. Uh, geographically, where have you had the most success and what's kind of next for Hotel Tonight? Yep, so we are operational in 30 countries. Um, the U.S. is where we started and is our largest market, followed by Europe. And uh, Europe is growing very nicely for us. And we're also in uh, Latin America. And, and Mexico right now is one of our fastest growing countries, and we're putting more resources into that. When you think of uh, where you are in terms of business, Business maturity. Uh, Y'all have raised some cash. Uh, in terms of your capital needs, you say you're investing in R&D. Are you going to need more cash on the balance sheet? Where are you kind of in the stage of the hotel tonight life cycle? Well, we're profitable as a business. Um, we've been very fortunate to uh, have uh, some great investors support us and uh, continue to support us. Um, and right now, it's really about focusing on deploying that capital into delighting the customer and making a really unique and differentiated and superior product experience. And and is mobile going to be kind of the heart and home of, of Hotel Tonight? Mobile is the heart and home, um, not because mobile for mobile's sake, but because mobile allows us to have the best customer experience. We can have a one-to-one -one conversation with our customers. We can provide eight-second bookings. We can use all of the technology that's going into the mobile platforms. And because we're only mobile, we can do things like location-based targeting, our, our unique geo rates um, that the other guys that are spread across desktop and other platforms can't do. So you're, you're kind of throwing out a bunch of things here that I know a lot of your competitors are would be a bit jealous of, being a player on mobile, profitability. You yourself have sold two, two companies in the past. Uh, what is next for Hotel Tonight? Do you want to stay independent? Do you think that somebody like a Google could come and gobble you up and bring them into their product portfolio? You know, I don't spend much time thinking about that. I'm really focused on providing a great experience for our customers, as I mentioned, and then our, our hotel partners, too. It's really important uh, for us to deliver incremental revenue to them, which is very different than our competitors who are more in competition with them. Um, so we work really hard to provide that targeting, provide those tools and, and services so that they can uh, feel very good about every booking uh, being incremental from Hotel Tonight. And that's how you're nabbing them onto the platform, getting the best hotels on the platform by paying out and keeping them with you. And that's right. And our loyalty of, of hotel partners is incredible. That was Hotel Tonight CEO Sam Shank speaking to Bloomberg's Alex Barinka. Coming up, the CEO of the biggest supplier of semiconductor hardware expects the industry to keep booming. We will get perspective from Applied Materials' Gary Dickerson next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President Trump addressed the nation one day after the worst school shooting in the U.S. in five years. Later this month, I will be meeting with the nation's governors and attorney generals. We're making our schools and our children safer will be our top priority. The president did not call for any action on guns. In South Florida, a 19-year-old, Nicholas Cruz, has been booked on 17 counts of premeditated murder after the attack on his old high school. The Senate rejected four separate immigration proposals today, further delaying the chance to provide 1.8 million dreamers with a chance for citizenship. Democratic Minority Leader Chuck Schumer tweeted after the vote, saying in part, if the president would stop, quote, torpedoing bipartisan efforts, a good bill would pass. Steve Bannon refused to answer questions during a closed-door meeting today with the House panel conducting the Russia probe. The panel's top Democrat, California Congressman Adam Schiff, says the White House strategist only agreed to answer 25 yes or no questions that have been written by the White House. Former advisor Banner, Bannon reportedly invoked some kind of presidential communication privilege with his refusal. Meanwhile, Bannon also met with Robert Mueller over the course of two days. He reportedly answered all questions presented by the special counsel. 
South Africa's new president, Cyril Ramaphosa, said today he will try not to disappoint the people of his country. After being officially sworn into office, Ramaphosa promised to move the South African government past its years of corruption scandals under former president Jacob Zuma, who resigned Wednesday. When one is elected in this type of position, you basically become a servant of the people of South Africa. And I'll seek to execute that task with humility, with faithfulness, and with dignity as well. The possibility of a U.S.-Turkish clash over Syria loomed over today's meeting between Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and President Recep Erdogan. The NATO allies are trying to mitigate some of the worst tension in years. Erdogan is fuming over U.S. military assistance to Kurdish fighters near the Turkish border, which Washington plans to continue. Secretary Tillerson, who is wrapping up a five-nation Middle East trip, says the U.S. and Turkey share common goals in that country. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. And more of Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang is straight ahead. Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Applied Materials reported its first quarter earnings yesterday. The biggest supplier of machinery used to make semiconductors beat the highest analyst estimates and gave a sales forecast that shows the electronics industry remains bullish about future demand. Earlier, I spoke with Applied Materials CEO Gary Dickerson and asked how long the company's sales run can continue. Take a listen. Well, you know, this is really the most exciting time in the history of the electronics industry. Technology is transforming major industries, transportation, healthcare, entertainment, retail, all of those different areas. And really at the foundation of those major industry transformations that will generate trillions of dollars of economic value is materials innovation and applied materials. So our semiconductor business, our display business, they're really firing all, all cylinders and uh, it's never been a better time to be a shareholder of applied materials. So if you've almost doubled sales since 2013, you know, how long do you think you can keep up that kind of growth? Well, if you look at the technology transformations that are happening, uh, over the last three years for autonomous vehicles, there's been $80 billion invested in changing trans transportation. Again, all of these major industries will change in fundamental ways. So you, and you see smart devices, uh, the natu AI natural language processing, all the smart hubs in our homes, eight chips in every one of those devices. Uh, so the silicon content is increasing as we go through these transformations. So I, you know, really our business is fundamentally stronger than it's ever been. And if you look at these trillions of dollars of changes that are going to happen in these major industries, you know, I'm, I've never been more op optimistic about the future than I am today. So sometimes investors looking at the long term worry that when things are this good in the chip industry that there can be supply guts and crashes like we've seen in the past. Should they be concerned? Well, again, it comes back to fundamental changes in the drivers. It used to be everybody remembers PC and enterprise uh, back in 2000 to 2010. You have a, a computer on your desktop, everybody waiting for the upgrade of the operating system. Them. Then we went to mobile social media. Every holiday season, there's a war for mobility leadership. You have billions of users. Everybody's carrying a camera in their pocket. They have a data center in their pocket. And then now you're going to an even bigger disruption in the overall economy with, again, transportation, healthcare, entertainment, retail, all of these things changing in fundamental ways. So do you think supply is going to be a problem? I think that uh, the, the industry is going to continue to grow mm -hmm. significantly over over the next several years. And also what we're seeing, so one of the things- But no that, supply issues. I think supply will be okay, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the demand, uh, if you look at profitability of our customers, profitability has never been better. That's an indication that supply is tight. Uh, so again, I, I really think that, uh, you know, all, that whole industry is gonna remain very healthy. The other thing is, I believe that AI and big data are the biggest changes in our lifetime. 
Uh, that battle for leadership is the biggest battle of our lifetime. And that's going to play out over the next several years. But no matter who wins in that AI war, applied materials is really at the foundation. We're providing the materials innovation for those new technologies. So for us, the, the future has never been brighter. So investors look at your results as an indication of demand for personal electronics in the yes. future. And the signs for smartphone demand just aren't good. What's going on there? Well, units are not going up, but content is growing up. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, electronics industry as a whole, over the last four years, our percentage of total spending has doubled within applied materials. So content is increasing and our role in enabling those big in inflections is also increasing. Um, let's talk about China because there's always talk about sure. China playing catch up to the chip industry. How soon do you think Chinese companies could actually become rivals um, to the current giants in the industry? So, so applied materials uh, has been in China for over 30 years. We have a very, very long history. Our market share in China is very, very strong. Last year, our revenue was around $3 billion. Uh, I th China has a strategic focus. They're the largest consumer of chips in the world, uh, and they want to have security in their, their data centers. Uh, so they're going to continue to invest. But if you look at where they're investing, so the domestic companies in 2018, they're investing more in trailing edge geometries, not leading edge geometries. So all of those smart devices, sensor technologies that are exploding, that's where the majority of the domestic investment is going right now. If you look at leading edge technology, I would look at the analogy of Korea and Japan back in the 80s. So in that transition, it took many, many years for Korea to grow their memory business to the leading edge. I think that's many, many years before that happens in China. But we do think investment will continue to go up, but uh, we don't see any hockey stick happening uh, anytime soon. That was Applied Materials CEO Gary Dickerson. Well, the Trump administration has joined the UK and Denmark in blaming Russia for, quote, the most destructive and costly cyber attack in history. The White House said the NotPetya attack was launched in June 2017 by the Russian military. The attack quickly spread worldwide, causing billions of dollars in damage across Europe, Asia, and the Americas. The White House press secretary warned of international consequences for such an attack. Coming up, more from our coverage at the Goldman Sachs Tech Conference this week. We will hear from George John of Coastal Ventures about policing online content and investing in AI. And if you have a Bloomberg terminal, you can check out TV Go, watch us online, click on our charts and graphics, and interact with us directly over the IB. Just go to TV Go on your terminal. And you can contact us on Twitter. I'm at Emily Chang TV, and check out TikTok by Bloomberg, the first 24 hour global news network streaming live on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Customers are expressing concerns with the cryptocurrency exchange after the company allegedly withdrew unauthorized money out of their accounts. According to a post on Reddit, one customer explains how they purchased a number of currencies for $500 and were later charged $1,500. Bloomberg reached out to Coinbase for a statement. The company responded, we are currently investigating an issue where some customers were charged incorrectly for purchases of digital currency and credit and debit with credit and debit cards. We will be reviewing all card transactions from the last few weeks to ensure all affected customers are notified. All customers can find updates on the Coinbase Twitter account and its blog. Well, Coastal Ventures partner George John built a successful career in marketing as co-founder of Rocket Fuel. So what does he make of the current controversy surrounding big tech firms like Facebook and Google about policing content? Bloomberg's Selena Wang caught up with George at the Goldman Sachs Tech Conference to discuss that and investing in AI. Take a listen. Looking at it, I feel like it's both the product of some unintended consequences, like uh, the Facebook news feed or the Twitter feed. Um, you know, there were a lot of good-natured computer scientists, I think, who were trying to help people find content that they would like to read, right? Um, but unfortunately, that 
that creates these bubbles where, you know, if you're a bit extreme and all you see is more and more extreme content, right, um, your view of the world is quite different, right, from someone else who's viewing another kind of content. So I think it's partly, um, you know, that good-natured uh, let's be helpful, <laughs> but uh, then being gamed, obviously, uh, by, you know, bad actors in the system. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of areas uh, in computing, I guess, where uh, they've been more evolved about trying to keep the bad guys out, right? So obviously everybody knows about intrusion detection and other forms of uh, computer security. Um, but I think we just hadn't thought about these open forums and the extent to which uh, we needed to be thinking about security there as well. And artificial intelligence has obviously greatly helped companies target and better reach that consumer. So what are some of the other intended consequences of that technology? There was actually a Dilbert strip where uh, Scott Adams, through the voice of Dilbert, said, you know, the only reason advertising is legal is because it doesn't work. Um, I think, you know, honestly, um, with uh, some of these companies uh, with you know, essentially a computer brain the size of the planet uh, that's developed an um, intense mastery of how to persuade people you know, to take certain actions, whether it's uh, clicking the ad or going ahead and you know, buying, buying the cookies or uh, you know, shopping for things they might not be able to afford or even getting interested in some political candidate. Um, it is something I guess we need to think about right now in terms of the messages that people receive and how they can be appropriately kind of uh, contextualized, right? I think people seem to understand that if there's an ad in a little rectangle, okay, that's somebody who's paying for my attention, I should be skeptical. Uh, but I think like there's other forms of advertising where it becomes uh, less and less understood, right? Mm -hmm. And so it feels reasonable there to have uh, protections for consumers. And how should these companies like Facebook, like Google, like Twitter, how do they protect themselves from some of these negative side effects that you were just talking about? Is it uh, Facebook or Twitter's job uh, to keep people from committing basically sort of information crimes on them? Or, or should we just define and say, um, you know, if you program a bot that pretends to be some sort of extremist and communicates to thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, um, should we go find that guy and, uh, you know, uh, punish them in some way, right? I, I don't know the right way, honestly. I think um, it feels like, um, you know, some of these companies, sometimes from the outside, they may seem to move slow. Um, like it seems like you can see, man, with all those resources, hundreds of billions of market cap, why isn't it already solved? But um, these are hard problems, and it's a bit of cat and mouse, you know? Uh, you put in filters, and the bad guys figure out some way around it. It's one, it's one reason, I suppose, like on the computer security side, we've seen an evolution from uh, rules-based security to more AI security. Uh, so the AI can kind of adapt with the bad guys, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have an investment called Silence that's kind of an example of that approach. Now, I want to get your take on uh, the ethics of building these algorithms. How do these companies and startups make sure that they're not inherently building bias into their data or the algorithms they're writing? If you're a medical company, you know, are you, uh, I don't know, I think we've evolved, I guess, from uh, the days when an AI group might just, like, survey everybody in the office, you know, for, let's say, for some facial recognition. Uh, I think um, it's understood now that you need a sample of the population that you're actually uh, trying to work within, right? Um, so whether that's gathering the right medical data for a broad community or um, or otherwise. So I think that's well understood. Um, but generally, uh, I mean, there was news, uh, I guess, in the last few weeks, I think, that uh, Professor Patty Moss at MIT was forcing her students to watch Black Mirror, uh, which I, I mean, it's it's very sobering as a, as a technologist to, to see that kind of imagination. Or Stuart Russell has a video um, giving his thoughts on what the future of uh, autonomous weaponry could be um, to try to encourage people to think about it now and, and have um, limits on it. And as an operating partner at Kosla, you work with several artificial intelligence startups. Mm -hmm. So I want to get your take on, is this sort of a catchphrase that a lot of startups are adding to their label to boost their valuation, or are you actually seeing the advancement of AI truly flourish at these companies? Yeah, no, there's there's genuine uh, sort of rocket science or AI you know, behind these companies. A lot of ours come out of, um, uh, you know, it's a grad student and a professor coming out of Stanford or you know, MIT or something like that. Not that everybody has to go to those schools, of course. Uh, Harvard's okay, I hear. Um, but, um, uh, but but there's there's real technology, and um, it's actually quite exciting, right? I mean, we've got uh, a company called AliveCore that can, uh, they built a little device that can take your EKG and diagnose it, uh, uh, or rather detect um, uh, atrial fibrillation uh, on the spot, or uh, we have a company called Ginger.io that's uh, it's a mental health company that helps uh, therapists interact uh, with patients in a way that the therapist can uh, get alerts, let's say, from the AI system saying, wow, you know, the thing they just said uh, is a really high likelihood of someone who's, who's likely to have some sort of self-harm in the future, and you should really be careful, maybe even escalate uh, to someone more, more well-trained. So there's a lot of, um, uh, I guess, real technology behind these things and just real applications that fit in with, um, uh, you know, Vinod's view about uh, transforming societal infrastructure with technology. And where do you see the most advanced applications of the technology right now? You mentioned healthcare. I see you're also invested in finance as well as the agricultural sector. Agriculture and food, I mean, it's, it's funny, food, I mean, you would think, 
Um, it, it seems simple. You throw things together, you cook it, whatever. <laughs> but uh, you know, we have Impossible Foods, which is um, significant, right? It's uh, these are only approximate, but it's uh, by by using uh, you know this engineered plant proteins instead of actually growing a cow. Um, you know, you use only about 10% the water, 10% the space, and 10% the you know harmful greenhouse gas emissions. But there's a lot of science there. They even have a, a data science team headed by a, a rocket scientist from Berkeley. Like literally, he ran an astronomy um, or astrophysics uh, research lab there, um, doing things like trying to predict. Uh, given a chemical uh, shape, what would it smell like, and will it smell, you know, appealing to a human? So there's all kinds of hardcore tech in these things, and I, I like these areas that have real science in them, you know, as well as uh, sort of AI and, and data science. That was George John of Coastal Ventures speaking with Bloomberg's Alina Wang at the Goldman Sachs Tech Conference. Coming up, our continuing look at how big tech plays the influence game in Washington, just how Airbnb won the right to operate in Cuba. This is Bloomberg. Nokia is monitoring the health of its fitness tracking division. The Finnish wireless company got into the health business two years after purchasing French startup Whitings for $212 million. The move allowed it to make and sell wearables connecting sleep trackers and more. But the unit has struggled since, losing $176 million last year alone. The review could result in a sale of the division as Nokia tightens its focus on networks and patent licensing. Now a story we are following tech firms' influence in the nation's capital. This time around, we are looking at how Airbnb used the power of lobbying to win big in Cuba. Now, back in 2014, then-President Obama began the process of restoring relations with Cuba, but his successor has been calling for limits on American travel there, as well as restrictions on commercial ties with the nation. But despite the Trump administration's efforts, Airbnb won an exception to keep operating there. So. Just how did it happen? Well, to answer that, I want to bring in Ben Brody, who covers tech lobbying for Bloomberg. So, Ben, you know, I remember when Airbnb uh, made this big splash in Cuba, and obviously it's a quickly growing market for them. How did they pull this off, given the political headwinds? Well, uh, one of the things that you basically do when you're kind of doing a tech lobbying campaign is uh, you hire some folks who can kind of get a meeting and they go to the relevant bureaus. In this case, it was the State Department or the National Security Council. It's part of the White House. And they basically say, look, here's why we think that you should do something a little different, a little narrower than what you're planning. Uh, and here's how maybe you can justify it. And so in this case, they said, well, you know, you can kind of cut off uh, relationships with hotels, but wouldn't it be great for the Cuban people, they said, uh, if a Americans could stay in their residences, and that's exactly what happened. Now, we don't know exactly who else might have been lobbying for this, and we don't know exactly how much time they might have spent at these agencies, but it does seem like that's how they pulled it off. Where does Airbnb rank in tech lobbying? We know tech companies spend a lot of money um, lobbying legislators in Washington. You know, how do they rank in the hierarchy? You know, I think that's really one of the amazing things about this is they kind of did this with what would be considered around here a relatively uh, low-key campaign. Now, that's still spending $500,000, $600,000. A lot of people uh, might like to have that added to their checking account if they don't think it's such a big deal. But when you're looking at a company like Google, they're spending $18 million last year on lobbying. So this is a much smaller effort, a very little sliver of influence that they went in seemingly and got done what they needed to get due with uh, relatively little... Uh, effort. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit about Google's lobbying efforts. You know, uh, uh, has often been a point of contention given just how much um, money they're spending there and the influence that they have. Absolutely. I mean, when you're counting by spending, uh, Google is uh, definitely the winner uh, in technology and the winner among most single companies uh, in this year. It's really interesting. My colleague, Mark Bergen, who, of course, covers Google, and I have been looking at these uh, disclosures, and it looks like they're kind of going back to the House and the Senate. Congressional lobbying, that's the norm. That's what a lot of companies do. They're always over there. Uh, you know, you're on the Hill. You're always seeing lobbyists. Uh, Google is really doing that. It's sort of backing away from some of that lobbying that it was doing at the Federal Trade Commission when it was worried about an antitrust case, uh, the Federal Communications Commission when there were some net neutrality issues and other communications things. And it really seems to be focusing in on maybe, uh, you know, beating back some of those probes that it's seeing in Congress, as well as trying to lock in some of its business opportunities, uh, things that come out of X and other experiments. So walk us into one of these meetings. How do they go? 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, very often it's somebody who has a prior relationship with uh, somebody in the institution. You know, you very often can see previous campaign workers, previous chiefs of staff. Uh, they kind of make a call. They go in and often what they bring, it's not a sack of cash, it's not a campaign donation, although they might note that. Very often what they bring is one of these education issues. Look, here's what you're going to do. Here's why you might not have realized it could affect us. Could be a slideshow, could be a PowerPoint, could be a more informal conversation. And they say, look, it's going to affect us this way. We really think what you should do is this other thing, or you should just write this carve out. And sometimes it works, and a lot of times it doesn't. And a lot of times we just don't know which way it went. And I know you're working on some future stories about lobbying and tech. Talk to us about some of the trends you're following. Uh, well, the, one of the things that's really interesting to us is as these tech companies get more powerful, where can get, they go for influence? They can go to Congress, they can go to the State Department, the National Security Council. Can they go all the way to the top? Well, it turns out they can, and just how much they're doing that is what we're going to be looking at. All right, Ben Brody, Bloomberg News. Thanks so much, Ben, for joining us. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. You can tune in this Friday for Bloomberg's coverage of the NBA Technology Summit in L.A. We're going to be speaking with industry leaders in sports, media, and tech ahead of NBA All-Star Weekend. Watch for our interviews with L.A. Clippers owner Steve Ballmer, Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.